Pat Riley once said, excellence is a gradual result of always striving to do the best. Hello everyone and welcome to Nerdy Optometrist, a podcast channel for all things optometry and this is your host Ukti Bora. Before we get into the episode, please remember to listen to this and all my episodes and do leave a review if you've enjoyed any one of it. Today I have Dr. Arthur Chan, who is an amazing nerd, and I'll tell you why. Dr. Arthur is a seasoned professional with over 18 years of experience in pharmaceuticals and medical devices. He previously held key roles at Novartis, Alcon, Insightech, and Bosch & Long. Yes, he's been to everywhere and every company you know about in the eye care space. Arthur has a BSc in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Alberta, a PhD in bio Biomedical Engineering from the University of Washington, and an Executive MBA from St. Joseph University. That's why I call him a true nerd. While we struggle to get one degree, I think he's got it all. He has multiple patents and is involved in academia as an adjunct professor at St. Joseph University. Arthur has received recognition for his contributions to the field of ophthalmology, including 2021 Ophthalmic World Leaders Catalyst Award. It's a true honor to invite such a huge nerd into a nerdy optometry family. Thank you so much, Dr. Chan, for your time and a warm welcome. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate your invite. And uh, I am a nerd and a geek at heart. So this is a perfect podcast to be on. So we have defined being nerdy is the new cool stuff. So I'm glad that, you know, you are a true nerd and a geek and that makes you so cool. So let's start from where it all began, right? Like you do have multiple degrees and you've kind of dwelled into multiple spaces. Tell us, how did you bump into the space of eye care? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I have always been fascinated with the eye. Um, I'm a biomedical engineer by training. And I think, you know, the eye combines optics, mechanics, electrical impulses, not that I'm biased, but I think it's like the most advanced organ in the body, right? So when I was an engineering student, I got to study how a prosthetic eye actually integrates with the surrounding muscles. Uh, I went to grad school and worked on developing a technology that actually zaps urine tumors with you know, ultrasound waves. So it went away from the eye. Um, it was like image guided non-invasive surgery. And after working for a startup company that commercialized this technique, um, I jumped at the chance to learn more about eye care and pharmaceuticals as an MSL or medical science liaison. Um, so I guess, you know, going from the uterus to the eye is like how I define moving up in this world, right? <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, but I, I think if you ask anyone what their most important sense is, um, I would say most people would probably say their their vision, right? That's why we do what we do. And, and being able to to help people see better and help their eyes feel better is truly rewarding. Um, and, and the people, you know, our optometrists like yourself and ophthalmologists and our industry professionals in eye care, having been in various therapeutic areas, I can honestly say that the innovation, the collaboration and the camaraderie here in the eye care industry is really, truly unique. So I'm really grateful to be here at Tarsus as the head of medical affairs and, and get to really bring um, a new medicine uh, to the world of eye care. It's super exciting. That's fantastic. And I'm so glad you bumped into the eye care space. And yes, you can be biased. We all are biased about eye care and our entire industry. So glad that you you kind of moved into this space and you're working in such an amazing uh, like pharmaceutical space where innovation can be critical as well as difficult. So what's, how was your journey like in terms of, you know, bringing so many innovation in the pharmaceutical space? Tell us a little more. How difficult or easy has been that journey for you? Yeah, yeah, thanks. I'm happy to share the story. So I wanted to be a biomedical engineer that had both medical device and pharma experience. Um, and it was an opportunity to, to work with eyes that brought me into the pharma world. So I spent a, about a decade in larger companies, Bausch, Alcon, Novartis, uh, you mentioned uh, many of them before launching products in both pharma and medical devices and intraocular lenses. Um, learned a lot, developed as a leader, built and grew some amazing teams. Um, and, and during this time, I also met a lot of physician and industry mentors. And I can't emphasize enough the value of having like really great mentors. Um, and so I started my career at a startup company and wanted to get some experiences and, and some great training at, at larger organizations. But I knew I always wanted to come back to a startup company. 
Um, mm. And it had some pretty strict criteria. It had to be like a really unique molecule, not like a Me Too or a change in concentration or delivery mechanism. There had to be like a compelling pipeline. Um, and I wanted to make an even bigger impact in the eye care field from having come from, from the larger companies. Um, but ultimately, it had to be with the right people. Yeah. And it was the really the people and the culture that drew me to, to Tarsus. So um, there's a guy that's also a, a fellow um, eye care nerd, and his name is Aziz Motawala. And he's someone that I've admired my entire career in eye care when I first started. Um, I thought maybe one day I would know as many people as him and be well respected <laughs> like Aziz. And we've never actually worked together prior to Tarsus. In fact, we were at competing companies. But when I first saw that he joined Tar Tarsus as the chief commercial officer, I reached out to congratulate him. And then we continued the conversation and he invited me to meet the rest of like the entire leadership team. Um, and every single person was as genuine, committed and hardworking and super smart and nerdy and humble as he is. Right. So the culture was exactly what I was looking for. And then the icing on the cake was when another good friend of mine, Dr. Liz, you also joined Tarsus um, as chief medical advisor. So my current role here at Tarsus allows me the opportunity to take everything I loved about the big companies combine it with a unique culture, build a team from scratch and launch the innovative new drug, right? Something completely different than anything that we've seen before in eye care. It's a molecule called Lotolaner in a new category, Demodex blepharitis, yeah. that can help millions of patients um, with an unmet need, right? There's there's so much to love. Uh, like talking about mites, right? Oh, yeah. my, here we go. The little yeah. mites here, right? <laughs> Who doesn't yeah. want to talk about mites, right? So um, that's how I ended up uh, being where I am here and, uh, um, you know, the, the journey in pharma led me to, to this company that I am now. So you did share a lot of very interesting things and I'm going to kind of, kind of break certain things and I will have some follow-up questions on each. Sure. One, when you said about like, you know, combining bio, uh, biomedical engineering and like you wanted like pharma and you wanted to make sure it's unique. For anybody to be in this space, what are some critical skills that they need to kind of learn and imbibe because you did launch a lot of products and you were like involved with big as well as smaller companies. What are the important skills that you carried from in each role for someone, you know, who's trying to explore this space? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. I, I think, first of all, you have to be really passionate about what you're working on, right? I think, you know, there's a lot of great products out there. There's so many options. You know, one of the, the things that uh, um, I often find myself at odds with is that there's so many opportunities in medical affairs. So so what do you want to pursue, right? Are you a big company person, small company person, global US pharma devices? First of all, I think picking something that you're really, really passionate about um, is, is really going to make your job really, really fulfilling. And then I think the second thing is to find something that you're really going to make an impact on with your skill set. I think uh, that it is so important to feel like you are are making a difference uh, in patients' lives and putting the patients first. And, um, you know, we have an all optometry team that we've hired for our field medical team and, and having people that really truly understand the nuances of clinical practice and who can be empathetic to our customers, I think is really important. Um, and I think the third thing is really having a surrounding yourself with good people, right? People that are mm -hmm. going to challenge you, people who are going to mentor you, people who are going to help you grow. I, I think, um, you know, you can't, you know, underestimate the importance of, of being with people that you really like working with that can open doors and help you network and also, you know, that you can bounce really good ideas off of. I think that's a really important aspect of, of the whole innovation process is, um, you know, the, the company I'm at now, the, the technology that the molecule started when, when two really smart people put their heads together and they uh, came up with an idea to treat a certain disease um, that had a lot of unmet need with a new molecule, right? So these ideas happen when you're surrounding yourself with really innovative and, and really creative people. So I think, uh, you know, emotional intelligence, empathy from a, being aware of your customer's needs perspective, um, having good mentors and people who will challenge you surrounding yourself with good people, uh, finding an opportunity that's fulfilling and making an impact are all things that are really important, at least from my perspective. That's wonderful. And I, I have to say that, like, you know, the work that Tarsus has done is truly commendable. And uh, the the mites that you just showed, like, I know everybody loved it. And I think you've done a great 
uh, work even on the marketing space because there's a lot of awareness, not just like marketing in terms of putting the product out, in terms of awareness and creating that uh, awareness amongst the practitioners that how important it is to treat this, like, you know, and how, what are the solutions and coming up with a solution yourself. So not just seeing a problem, but coming up with a solution that can be effective and useful for the end users. I love the fact that you mentioned that you have a team of optometrists who are kind of leading it because it's very important to have a very strong clinical team to put the message out. So kudos to you and your team for, you know, thinking and addressing this, this issue. Sometimes you can just hire like a salesperson who might not be clinically sound. I'm not saying they can't be trained, but it's different when an optometrist comes and talks to it. It's like a doctor talking to a doctor who's under. Yeah, it's a peer-to-peer -peer no -peer conversation, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I loved what you mentioned about like, you know, a large company or smaller companies. I myself have experienced both. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you, if you resonate with this. So working with smaller companies or like startup, it's fun because you kind of tend to do everything, but you lack structure. Sometimes there's uncertainty, but there's a lot of exposure. With bigger companies, you get to step back, look at like global perspective and there's like a lot of structure. Sometimes it can slow you down uh, in, in the way, you know, things are moving forward. Do you have any thoughts about how, how would you choose like, should I start with a big company, learn and then go to a startup or start with a startup, get your hands like, you know, dirty in terms of like doing everything and then moving to a big company. Do you have any feedback there for, for someone who's kind of trying to learn? Yes. Yeah, so, so I'm a lifelong learner. I think most nerdy optometrists are also lifelong learners, right? <laughs> yeah. So it, I think the more important question is, um, again, the people piece, right? Like who yeah. are you going to be working with and what are you going to be learning? Um, I want to be learning something new every day. Um, every person I bring on to the team, I always say, I hope I learn from you as much as you will hopefully learn from me, right? And I think um, when you have um, an environment where you can thrive and learn every day, uh, that's important, right? So there are small companies that will really invest in their employees and invest in the you know career growth and, and development and, and learning. And if you're with good people that are going to be willing to invest in you, you're going to find that in large companies and small companies as well. I think that there is, you know, a lot more, um, you know, that you will be doing in a small company that is like diverse tasks, right? Because there's only, you know, so many people in the company to do certain things. So you get more exposure um, and the other thing I like about small companies is that you have a lot of uh, opportunities to, um, you know, meet with and, and speak with leadership and and have the opportunities that if you were a company that was like five times the size and 10 times the size, you may not have as many opportunities, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, I think there, there's something for, for everybody out there and it's just finding the right environment that you will be able to thrive in. Um, I, I do like the fact that also with a smaller startup company, um, you know, there's that entrepreneurial sense of, of innovation um, and that speed and that efficiency of being able to to innovate you know just looking at how quickly we were able to bring a brand new drug in a brand new category to market is truly incredible especially during the, the pandemic times yeah. and um, you know how quickly we were able to do disease state education um, and the recognition I think of, of Tars is that having a medical team, um, even before we knew whether or not we were going to get the product approved to educate on disease state education is important because you know when you're a, a, a disruptor in the eye care space, when you're truly trying to bring a new molecule to the market in a um, you know in a new category, Demodex blepharitis, for example, that never has had a product before. Um, there's a lot of education that needs to take place with the eye care providers, right? So I, I think creating that. Um, you know, that the momentum of wanting to diagnose, wanting to learn more about this disease, knowing that you as a physician, especially as an optometrist who wants to get into medical optometry, you can find a, a simple diagnosis that would help millions of patients out there using an equipment that they already have, which is a slit lab, um, is a really compelling story. But you need to have a pure resource to be able to tell that yeah. story, which is why the optometrists on our team have been so effective um, along with the little mites that they they bring out for uh, for education. Yes, and I really like like I was in one of the trade shows and I loved how they use mites for educational purposes and you can actually see it. And I'm sure that would be very useful even for explaining the treatment for the end users. So I think it's a great tool. Like whoever developed it, I think it, kudos to your entire team for building it because it not only educates 
the doctors, you know, but it also makes their life easy to communicate the same to the patients because sometimes like, not sometimes, I think majority of the times, like we all are all visual learners. What we see is what we learn, we resonate and we try yeah. to kind of then follow the treatment plan versus like me like, oh, I right. see, I see, you know, uh, mites and I want you to treat you for, uh, for it versus actually showing it to the patient and yeah. what it can do. I think that has a like, lot of impact. And I think that's a great, great tool that, you know, uh, you have created for the entire industry. And Thank for you. Yeah. And, and more things to come. Yeah. And to be able to um, have the confidence and, and comfort of, of knowing how to speak to patients about um, this condition, I think it reduces the, the stigma, especially since, you know, 58% of all eye care uh, patients will have um, we'll have them with mice, right? And, and so I think when you, when you substantiate um, education with uh, uh, a, a good way of being able to communicate good data to patients, then it becomes a lot more, um, you know, first of all, you know, believable, but also, um, you know, it, it, the patient conversation becomes a lot easier for the physician. Yeah, and also with the solution that Arsus has, it's not just showing that you have demodex mites, right? It's also right. showing like you have this and we have the solution. That also kind of right. helps to comfort the patient as well as the practice right. that can be more confident. Like I'm not yeah. sure when scary, it's just not like hot fermentations and like, you know, just it's like, a really hard conversation like to have with patients to diagnose them with something and then not have a effective and safe yes. solution for it, right? So it becomes an easier conversation when you have a, a a treatment that you can do, uh, you know, in a certain time frame that will, uh, you know, that will eradicate the mites and uh, you know reduce the cholera. So yeah, totally agree. Yes, absolutely. And so, tell us a little more about your role in Tarsus. Like, what do you do, and how is like how does your role or day to day work looks like? Yeah, so we talked a little bit about the the field medical team. Um, you know, the, really the pure resource for our eye care providers and their clinic staff. Um, and, and building a team from scratch was something I, I was really excited about having this all optometry. In fact, we were the first, and I believe it's still the only all OD uh, field medical team. Um, and as I mentioned before, you know, just understanding the nuances of clinical practice and, and you know, you can't just tell everyone to have a conversation about your patients at uh, Demodex Blood Fridays because that, you know, adding four minutes to every patient will ruin a, a clinic day, right? So, um, but also what's really unique about our team, I think, is just being able to hire a really diverse group of individuals, people with different roots and alimaters and experience. And I think, they all have similar ambitions and drive and, and that emotional intelligence and empathy is so important, but you create this team that really like bonds and gets along and fosters this like really great culture of, of like belonging. Right. So that's the field medical team. They do, they go out there and do a lot of education and educational programs. Um, but another part of medical affairs that's really important to note is that we are, are laying out a foundation of scientific evidence. Right. So, I mean, actually the first person I, I hired onto the team was our, our head of uh, medical and scientific communications guy named James Moon. And he actually um, is in charge of data generation and dissemination um, through these peer reviewed published literatures, right? So when you have peer reviewed published manuscripts published, it validates our science and allows us to gain a lot of credibility within the scientific and medical um, community. So when I joined Tarsus, we actually didn't have any published literature. I think we're up to like 15 manuscripts and over 50 conference abstracts presented in just the, uh, you know, a little over three years. So when you have like really well conducted clinical trials and, and good data, it also enables the data to be included in like society guidelines and um, also independently conducted meta-analyses, which is like the highest level of evidence. This is like what the nerds really want to see, right? These meta-analyses. So um, to be able to validate the science and data is something that medical affairs um, does. And then we have a, a medical director team actually led by an optometrist, uh, Ruby Doshi, and, and then our, our associate medical director, uh, also an optometrist, uh, Leslie O'Dell, which I think uh, a lot of people know Ruby and Leslie, but, um, you know, they, they uh, lead our medical education uh, grant process and an investigator initiated trial process as well. So I think sometimes the best ideas and best education comes from the physicians who are using our products. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's great to be working for a small company that also believes in, in supporting accredited medical education as well as uh, research beyond this company sponsored trials, right? If somebody has a really great idea or if somebody has an educational um, forum that they'd like to have support for, our medical team uh, handles that as well. So, um, and then of course, you know, all these uh, senior medical ambassadors on our, our all OD field medical team need training. So we provide the training 
to them so that they can be the best they can be in the field. Um, so it's it's all encompassing, right? We take all the the insights that are collected from our interactions and our medical education, and those insights turn into medical strategies that shape our medical messages. And then those messages get conveyed back by the field team to their customers. So just as important as it is for us to educate the community is all the insights that we gather back from the the uh, healthcare uh, providers and the eye care community to really understand how we can continue to better serve our patients and our physicians. I think this is very, very interesting because I know lately I've heard this term a lot called evidence-based practice that really resonates with all the clinicians. And I feel what Tarsus is doing is helping practitioners, you know, have that confidence in treating uh, Demodex with with these evidence that you kind of are talking about. And it's great how it's, it's an endless loop. You might feel like, okay, you know what, I've done this. No, but it's like you learn more and you have so, right. much, so much for people, you know, who have some good research ideas. You know, Tarsus is looking to kind of support those kind of ideas if they can kind of reach out to to your medical affairs team. So yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tarsus-science.com is our, our website for medical affairs. And I am, you know, I mentioned earlier, I'm a lifelong learner. I just love being in the field with our, with our optometrists, with our ophthalmologists, with their staff and, and clinicians, and just listening to like what their experience is like, right? I think the more we listen out in the field, the the more we we gain, you know, it's it's easy to want to go in there and we have lots of great new data that we want to share. But, you know, sometimes just taking a step back and listening to um, you know, how their clinic day is going and, and being out there and, and hearing what their demodex blepharitis patients have to say and, and just see what they they um, have to, to endure, you know, it is really, you know, no pun intended eye opening, right? So it's, it's really um, great to just be out there and listen and learn. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's sometimes difficult because we tend to kind of just give and educate and educate and educate. But then yeah. I think it's good that you mentioned like step back, like pause. You might not have yeah. to educate people. You can just listen, learn, and then you might just be able to kind of, you know, be more productive in whichever yeah. way you're trying to communicate. So that's that's a sure. great thing. <laughs> So tell us about some some challenges. I know you have uh, an amazing career in this space. Did you face any challenges throughout in any of the roles? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'll be vulnerable and say like, you know, when, when there are so many opportunities in, in medical affairs, sometimes it's really hard to choose, right? Like sometimes I joke with my kids, I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. But, uh, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, like you can pursue careers in a big company, small company, global, pharma, devices, US, what indication, back of the eye, front of the eye. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of opportunities. So sometimes it, it's easy to, to you know, lose focus and, and, and just, you know, I think when you're with a small company like Tarsus, you're focused on a one disease area, one drug. Um, there's a lot of focus, but, uh, you know, in some of the larger organizations, there's so much you can do in medical affairs, right? So I think it goes back to like, where do I believe I can make the, the most impact? And sometimes you have to make, you know, tough decisions. You know, I, I have, um, you know, always been a big believer and I share with folks that, you know, if you want to to make a move or, or do something different, do, do it when things are going really, really well. So you're making with the best of uh, that decision with the best of mindset, right? And so, um, you know, challenge often is like, you know, um, you know, what, what do I want to do with my career, right? Especially for folks who are just starting out. And when you find something that you really love, and when you're just like starting to launch something that is like game changing and highly impactful, like that's when you found something that you want to stick with. Right. And so yeah. I just like, you know, absolutely. I, I feel like I found my home. I love what I'm doing now. And I, I would encourage anyone who has been able to find that to really like, you know, embrace it. Right. Just like, if it's fulfilling, if it's impactful, just embrace that experience. Um, for me, you know, especially in a startup company, I find it really hard to say no, um, personally, like I, I take on a lot and sometimes it's, it's hard to balance. Right. And, um, as someone that, that wants to do a lot and, and, and often, you know, overcommit myself to doing a lot of things. And as a leader, I think I also have to be empathetic to my team members. And while we have high expectations of, of myself and, and others, like, we, we have to make sure that, um, you know, we're setting some really clear objective expectations, but also ensuring that there's balance as well, right? When you're in a smaller company, there's the tendency, you know, there's a lot of workaholics and, and people that are really, really committed, right? And we all do a great job and we we'll always love hanging out together, but uh, just ensuring that balance, um, you know, and it starts with me as a leader setting that example, right? So sometimes I find it challenging to to say one thing, you know, have a balance to, 
you know, life, work, uh, experience, and, and then, you know, not really lead by example. I got to do, I think, better myself to, <laughs> to do that. Um, and, you know, of course, you know, finding the right opportunities to, to coach the team, um, again, listening, um, really understanding what drives others, what motivates others. You know, that's always something that's really good to know because um, people like to be challenged in different ways, right? People like to be challenged and, and motivated and rewarded in different ways. So I think, you know, understanding some of that um, can sometimes be challenging because most people are very humble and they won't say, you know, how they like to be, be uh, um, recognized. But I think understanding that is good too. And then I think, um, you know, so, so, you know, I talked about career um, personally as a leader, but as a company here at Parsis, you know, what we're doing here is actually really difficult, right? We are introducing a disease and a product at the same time. I mean, this disease has been around for a long time, but there just hasn't been a lot of education or awareness about how prevalent demodex blepharitis is. And, and, you know, that's a, a lot of people that we can make an impact on. So educating those physicians that can make the most impact and then continually um, expanding our reach to educate more physicians. And then, you know, introducing a product at the same time. And as you mentioned, when you create a category and then you have a solution for it, the conversation becomes a little bit easier, but you're also trying to do two things at once, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, when, when you're trying to be uh, a leader, a disruptor, uh, first in, in class, new molecule, new category, um, it is challenging. It's a, it's a lot of hard work. And I think finding that balance, um, you know, within myself to, to lead, to coach, to mentor, have time for myself, my family, and still do a, a good job. Um, I, I wish we could uh, have more hours in the day. I think that's a, a challenge, right? To find more time to do the things that we love both at work and, and uh, in our personal lives. Absolutely. Did you have any pushback from the industry? Because as you rightly mentioned, right, like it is a new, it's not a new disease, but it's like new awareness that you're creating along with the new product you're launching. Did you have any pushback? Yeah, I think not, not so much from the, the eye care industry, but I think, you know, when patients are used to, um, you know, routines such as using over-the-counter products uh, to um, do lid hygiene, right? Um, mm. And you get into a routine, introducing something new um, does require uh, habit forming and it does require people to really understand the value of what that product brings, especially if there's a, a price tag associated with that. And mm. speaking of price tag, it's also challenging when you bring a new product to market to ensure that the payers, the insurance companies are on board, right? A yeah. physician may prescribe a really great new medicine, but uh, uh, patients need to be able to afford and have access to that medication. Um, and, and so that's something that we're really committed to as well, to ensure that patients have access to the medication, to ensure that patients can afford that. We have an amazing market access team that is working with the insurance companies to, to showcase the, the benefits and the value that this drug truly brings, right? When you have a definitive treatment, that's a six week course of therapy, um, and you're able to, um, you know, have it uh, really help patients in, in ways that patients haven't been helped before with over-the-counter drugs and even some of the in-office procedures, right? You're, you're really eradicating the root cause with this drug versus just, the, um, you know, alleviating symptoms or, or cleaning up debris, right? The, the root yeah. cause is the mite itself. And when you have something that can penetrate deep down in the lash follicles and eradicate the root cause, then patients truly feel that there's a solution that is is helping them with the root cause of their problem as well. So yeah, yeah there's a lot of education and and uh, convincing, um, not so much from industry, but from a how do we how do we you know educate and market this to patients as well as from the uh, insurance perspective as well. I think you did bring up a very interesting point about making it affordable, breaking the habits on the patient side, because as you said, like, you know, you could come up with great product, but if you don't have end users, this doesn't make sense. If it's not yeah. affordable, it again might fail. If insurance companies are not on board, specifically in the US environment, like we are so mm -hmm. much dependent with like, you know, what we get from the insurance company. So mm -hmm. building that relationship there, I definitely feel you, you, you truly have a team of nerds to make all this happen. Yeah, yeah. There's a really strong partnership between uh, medical affairs uh, providing the the data and the uh, evidence uh, for the the market access team to be able to uh, to to share that with their their payer customers, right? So um, you know, whereas we're educating the 
the optometrists and the ophthalmologists and, and their clinic staff, uh, our market access team is educating the payers um, on this new product as well. All right. So we did learn a lot about Narcissus, your work, your journey. But now we're going to go to our game segment where I just want to know a little uh -oh. bit about yourself. Sure. So it's a simple rapid fire game. All I'll be doing is asking you a few questions just to know you a little more. Uh, and whatever answer comes first in your mind, just, just throw it at us. That's as simple as that. So put me on the spot. So put me on the spot here. Yes, you know, you've been on spot since the time we started the interview, but you have excelled so far, and I'm sure you will you will crush it in the rapid fire as well. So, are you ready for it? Yes, let's do it. All right. <laughs> All right. Tell us about your favorite destination. Oh, okay. Wow. So I am um, originally from Calgary, Canada. I love the mountains. I love skiing. Um, my favorite destination is a place that uh, I've been to uh, many times in my childhood is Banff, Alberta, Canada. All right. Banff and Lake Louise. <laughs> a fun fact about you, which most of the people don't know. Oh, um, I can play the piano and I can play by ear because I have a perfect pitch. So if someone can name a song, I can, uh, uh, or someone can sing a song or, or um, play the music for something, I, I can play it back. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> Tell us about your favorite cuisine. My favorite cuisine is, uh, it's got to be sushi. I can <laughs> eat sushi all day. Like I, I learned how to make sushi, but it's also fun to have uh, someone make sushi for you and just to try. It's like art on a plate, right? And yes. just love trying all the different uh, uh, types of fish and rolls. And uh, yeah, big sushi fan. Wonderful. Uh, a hobby or something you do when you have some time out of your busy schedule? Ah, so um, so as, a, as an engineer, I love like um, like home renovations, right? That That's a hobby that I love to do. I also enjoy running, um, cycling, um, you know, being outside, I think is it's really nice hiking, skiing, you know, growing Don't up you in get Canada. Time to do all of that, like um, I wish I had more time. See that that's where this whole balance piece comes in in handy, right? If we can uh, create more hours of the day, yeah. Um, but yeah, like renovating houses and and like tearing down walls, that's really satisfying actually. At times, so. <laughs> wonderful. If you were to interview a guest, dead or alive, who would that be, and what would the question? Be? Wow, that that's um, that's a, a good one. So the the first person that actually comes to mind is um, actually a few folks that come to mind, but I would say I want to interview like someone like Bill Gates, right? I'm not just saying that because it's like a nerdy optometrist, but um, just to hear his his journey and passion and perseverance, um, you know, Bill Gates or Steve Jobs. I was hesitating because I was like, you know, they're, they're both good people. Um, but also to understand a little bit more about like, you know, their leadership style and, and mm -hmm. how it fosters innovation and how they're able to create like categories, like what we're doing here at Tarsus, like creating, coming up with something that people didn't even realize that they needed. Right. But now yeah. we can't let go of like, like, like this, right? So our, our, our cell phones. So um, I, I think, um, yeah, one of those, Steve Jobs or, or um, Bill Gates. Exactly. And then also, you know, the the philanthropy and how they give back to society, I think mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, really inspiring as well, right? So, so seeing how they find the time or seeing how they're able to be really successful, but also be able to give back to society, I think is great. Wonderful. One thing that you would like to change or add in the eye care space? I think for me, seeing more new molecules come to market, um, seeing more drugs out there for unmet needs. Um, I think innovation is really, really strong in eye care. Um, and I think not only on the pharma space, but if we're able to um, maybe combine some of the virtual and augmented reality with some of the the eye care technologies out there, whether it's um, in you know surgical training, remote uh, surgical procedures, or also integration of um, augmented reality and virtual reality in like lenses, and um, you know I think there's a lot of innovation for new products out there. So 
there's a lot of products out there that are you know, reused molecules. And, and the reason why I joined Tarsus is because it's a brand new and unique molecule. I think we need more unique molecules and, and um, really cool um, you know, devices that uh, marry uh, eye care technology with uh, augmented mm -hmm. virtual reality. That'd be really cool. Oh, so embracing innovation and technologies, I think what, what yeah. we're looking for. All right. So you did wonderful in a rapid fire. Uh, so good job on that. It wasn't that hard. You did you you did excel even in rapid fire. And we did let, definitely learn a lot more about you. Uh, with that, before I let you go, do you have any final takeaway message for all my listeners? I think it, it is so inspiring to have you bring so many new ideas and technology to the optometric space. Um, I, I think there are so many opportunities for optometrists to make a difference at such a versatile degree, and we can always use more optometrists in the industry. So um, find mentors out there. Uh, and if you are an optometrist in the industry, pay it forward um, and, and really like embrace the idea of bringing new innovation to to your peers. Uh, I think this whole peer-to-peer -peer, um, education and, and having a peer resource um, from industry to the clinical practice and from clinical practice to, to industry, that, that bond is so important. So um, we absolutely love our optometrists and our team. I can't uh, give them enough kudos and shout outs. And uh, we need more uh, really smart nerdy optometrists to uh, join industry to bring the innovations uh, back to the clinic. That's wonderful. So definitely, uh, this has been a really nerdy episode. So thank you once again, Dr. Chan, for all your time. Uh, for all my listeners, I will be dropping in the link for Dr. Chan so you can connect with him probably on LinkedIn. And I'll also be sharing more details about Tarsus. So do check them out. They're definitely doing some amazing work in this space. And if you need any more information, I'm sure you can reach out to me or to the team to learn more. Uh, with that, thank you so much once again for all your time and all your nerdy insights. We truly enjoy Thank it. you. Yeah. And remember, stay mighty, right? Yes, stay mighty. <laughs> Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you.